Hey everybody, welcome to this week's roundup. I just wanted to very quickly follow up on that mini review I did on that Marantz receiver. A couple of people had asked me about compatibility and it is compatible with GC video devices and it is also compatible with the Game Boy Advance consoleizer. So if you have something that's audio over a DVI signal via an HDMI cable, it's totally compatible. So I've just been really, really impressed with this thing. I'm not pushing anybody on it. Get whatever is best for you, your room and your budget. But I wanted to follow up super quick because I had a lot of questions about that. I just thought it was such a neat little device. But anyway, back to what's a little more relevant and let's jump in and see what's been going on in the retro scene this week. Pre-orders are now open for another Nuon controller adapter. We had zero options up until recently, and now we have two. The USB-based one from controlleradapter.com that I recently talked about, and this one from Songbird Productions that allows you to use an N64 controller on your Nuon, because that's kind of the style controller that it was originally meant to have. And I think there's at least one person out there that likes the N64 controller. All kidding aside, though, this is a, a very awesome option. The price is $50, and it's due to ship in mid-March. So if you would like an N64 controller on your Nuon, I would definitely check this out. If you wanted a variety, maybe get one of each, because uh, respectfully, you could buy one of each of these controller adapters and controllers to go with them for less than the price of just one Nuon controller. So fairly priced adapters, um, they, it seems to be great choices. And this one particularly has been tested to work on the Samsung N501 and Toshiba SD2300. However, it should be compatible with all Nuon players. But anyway, um, I'll follow up and probably do a live stream with the Nuon that I was just able to borrow and uh, it, kind of check out the game library and see what's up with it. Pre-orders are open for vinyl versions of the Journey to Silius and Euphoria soundtracks. These were NES games, and the vinyls have one game on one side and the other game on the other side. So it's a single LP release that costs about 25 bucks, and it's scheduled to release in quarter three of this year. The Journey to Silius includes two unused jingles from the game files, and Euphoria includes two bonus tracks from the title screen that you could only hear after the first time booting the game, and the second track from the Game Over section found in the US prototype version. So if you're a fan of the games and the soundtrack, this seems like a pretty fun collector item thing that also gets you some tracks that you might not have been able to hear as easily while playing it. So check out links in the description if you're interested. Fixel has just announced that his upcoming IDE emulator will ship with support for PSX DVRs. So a very quick background, the PSX, while many of us refer to the PlayStation 1 as that, was actually a PlayStation 2 released only in Japan that had DVR support as well as standard PlayStation 2 support. And when the internal IDE hard drives in those die, you can't really easily bring those back to life. So you could actually see many of those dead or or for parts are not working for sale on Yahoo auctions or on eBay because the hard drive is dead in them. So you're now able to use this IDE emulator in place of that hard drive and bring that console back to life. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that would get you over original PS2, other than the fact that it's freaking awesome, and I think I would much rather have one of those sitting on my shelf back there than just a regular old PS2, but it's still awesome that Fixel is continuing to add support to this stuff while also working on getting them produced, and I'm sure just like his 3DO emu uh, optical drive emulator, that there'll still be bug fixes and support afterwards. So this is not a cheap product, but this is definitely a you get what you pay for type of product. So of course you can get a PlayStation 2 and a memory card and something, you know, whatever you need to load ISOs for cheaper than just this, but that's not the point. If you want to use something like a PSX or some of the many other devices this thing's going to support, then that's probably going to be where most of the sales go to. People that want the ability to do stuff like this. And while it's not uh, easy to open up all of this stuff and unplug and replug, it is obviously plausible that you could use this on multiple different consoles depending on your setup and all of that stuff. Once again, this is not like a plug and play device. You would have to open up your console and you know unplug and replug inside the console, but still nothing stopping you from doing it if you wanna try it out on multiple different things before you decide if you wanna buy one or multiple or whatever else. But anyway, I'm just excited because it sounds like a neat product and I'm certainly looking forward to see what the community could do with it. 
This week's roundup is once again brought to you by JLC PCB, and this week we're continuing to learn how to use their PCB assembly service, as well as all of the quirks that would go into doing this with any PCB manufacturer. And this week, we think we got it, but we figured out what at least one of the issues was, and it had to do with how we generated the files in Eagle. So a very quick overview. There are a bunch of different softwares that people generally use to do their PCB orders on. And when we had trouble figuring out what was up with the sync voltage on the last batch that we tested, and we tested every component, so we couldn't figure out what that was. So we figured, hey, we wanted to change the VGA connector anyway. We wanted to make one other tiny little change. So let's just do that and regenerate the files. And that just caused a whole bunch of other weird issues. And it turns out that if you're generating that stuff from Eagle, depending on what you're building, and especially if you're doing an assembly as well, it might actually be easier to import that file that you generated with Eagle into Easy EDA and have that generate the pick and place file and the bill of materials file, the bomb. So if you're just making the PCB, that shouldn't be an issue, just generate it the way you normally would. But using JLC PCB software to line all of that stuff up is definitely where you would get that advantage from. The other thing we ran into is something that is nobody's fault whatsoever, but we kept having to readjust the bomb because parts were going out of stock every time that we would upload a new file. So we would upload a file, there would be a problem with the placement of one of the parts or one of the parts wasn't detected because of how Eagle generates its pick and place file and its bill of materials. So we would get it all up and running and then we'd get to the bomb section and there would be no part available. So I wanted to really make this something that I could just release the files and people could make their own if needed. This is kind of a niche item, so I'm not really sure how many people would, would actually need this, but I just wanted to do it both to teach everybody how to learn how to use these PCB assembly services, but also just, you know, in case you could apply this to your own products if you run into the same issues. So overall, definitely thanks to JLC PCB for their patience, for continuing to work with me, even though I do these ads, definitely my style. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind would be writing these scripts for me, but I just like to always lead these with honesty and I'd like to help everybody else learn from our mistakes because sometimes it is our fault and it's just something that you might run into. And other times it's weird stuff like this that it's really nobody's fault. You just got to kind of figure out what to do as you go. So uh, hopefully this will be the last one where we're talking about this. And next week I could actually show a working design, but I guess we'll find out soon enough. Gretsch Tech has just released a blue retro based adapter that kind of takes a slightly different approach to the other ones that are out there. A lot of adapters that you see are dongle based, so you just plug them into a single controller input, pair your controller and use it that way, which for many people that's perfectly fine and probably the best method, but for other people, what if you had four controllers that you wanted to plug in? You would have to then buy four controller adapters, whereas Gretsch Tech kind of approaches this from instead of a dongle, it's a box with pigtails. And I think that's kind of an interesting way to do it because now you have an external box and you can plug in four N64 cables into each of the four ports. So now one box can pair four different controllers. So if that's something that you might want to do, this could be much more cost effective. It's all about choices. I think they're all going to be good solutions. And this one is also based off of Blue Retro, which was designed by Darth Cloud. So you're going to get the same performance. Also, there's some interesting choices that you could make with this. If you wanted to, you could buy one of these boxes and then make or purchase a bunch of other adapter cables and use one box for multiple different consoles. You would just have to then unplug and replug the, the different adapters on the side of them. And with depending on your consoles, this might be an easy workflow. There are a few consoles that would all work together. There are some that would re require a firmware flash when you do it. So it's really one of those things that you're going to have to check out their website, check out Dave's post here for more info and kind of see what's a good workflow for you. Because if you end up getting one of these adapters that works with all of the consoles you want to use without flashing different firmwares, you could end up saving a lot of money and having a pretty easy workflow of just swapping stuff around when you're playing. And on the flip side, you could just be saying, no, I don't want to do any of that. I want to leave a single dongle plugged into my console and be done with it. And that is also great too. That's why I love choices so much. And I love that people are really taking the blue retro project, the open source project and running with it. So it, it's great to see open source stuff used the right way, not just stolen. 
talking to you bitfunks and uh it's very cool just to kind of see another way of going about doing this so please check out dave's post there's a lot of details in here that might add some clarification and maybe someday i'd be able to try one out myself and do a, a live stream demo of or something like that but it looks like a pretty cool adapter and definitely something that i'd want to keep my eye on to see what they come up with next Pre-orders are now open for a new batch of USB to DB15 adapters, which is a piece of hardware that's designed to allow you to use USB controllers or fight sticks on any kind of super gun or any device with a DB15 Neo Geo style connector. There's a couple of changes and updates as well. There's some new cases for them, and there's also a newer version that you could mount internally for arcade board consolization mods. And there's also support for more controllers, Xbox Series S and X, Astro City Mini, uh, and I think a few others. Now, this is an ultra low lag adapter. This is a one millisecond controller adapter. So this absolutely is one that you could feel com confident using for tournaments, for practicing, everything. I mean, it's from the perspective of a fight stick adapter for competitive fighting games, you could consider this a zero lag adapter. So if you want more info on it or to pre-order one or just to kind of check out more info on the project, please check out Ronnie's post. Uh, there's all the info you need, pictures and links to everything that you could imagine for the project. I recently posted an interview with the developer who made the Game Boy Interceptor and the Game Boy Wi-Fi module, and we really dug deep into those projects and a little bit about how Sebastian writes the code and does stuff like this. And it was really interesting. It was a bit more technical than some of the more laid back, silly podcasts that I've done, but I really think my fellow nerds, especially anybody who's into developing or even just info on the Game Boy would be pretty impressed with this because Sebastian really talks a lot about how this was made to work and the fun different ideas he had implemented. And basically, I just had a, a really good time sitting back and listening to all the cool stuff he had to say about it. So if you're even slightly interested, maybe just give this a try. And once again, it is a little bit more on the technical side, but I feel like my fellow nerds would really appreciate that. So thanks again to Sebastian for taking the time to do it. And as always, these are available everywhere. I just want to make these podcasts easy for you to listen to. So search any service for Retro RGB Sebastian and it should pop up. And if we're not on your favorite podcast service, you could either download the MP3 file directly or let me know and I'll try to get on there because I don't really have favorites or care about any of that stuff. I just am appreciative of anybody listening. So I want to make it easier for you to do so. Now it's time for this week's Mr. Updates, Care of Lou from Lou's Retro Source. As usual, I'm just going to skim through these, and if anything at all piques your interest, please check out Lou's video where he'll have more information and very often visual demos of the stuff that we're talking about. But first up, Mr. Walrus on the Mr. FPGA forums has just posted a guide setting up a Thrustmaster racing wheel. So if you wanted to use a steering wheel with games like OutRun, this should be a great place to start. Um, Hotego mentioned last week that work is done for a, a lot of work is done for a haunted castle core and all that's needed is the CPU to be finished. So that's pretty cool. Haunted castle is moving along and Hotego also posted some progress on the Konami CPU, which is used in games like Aliens and The Simpsons. Now, there's still a long way to go, but that's pretty incredible progress. So that's really cool to see. Todd from Retrofrog is launching a work in progress case that has a keyboard built in. So imagine like a old school Commodore 64, TRS-80, whatever, PC in the case type of thing with, or yeah, PC in the keyboard type of thing. And I saw the pictures on Twitter and it looked really cool. And it's something that I think if you wanted that look and feel of a mechanical keyboard and that old school style computer, I think you would really appreciate it. But I also kind of thought for myself, how often am I in some kind of project or on a live stream and I need to access the keyboard and then I got to go fumbling around looking for my USB keyboard. Maybe I should buy one of these things just to always have a keyboard available to use when I'm running my Mr. Test Rig. But uh, if you're even slightly interested, definitely check out the posts. Um, I think they should be available for Patreon subscribers, but there's pictures right on Twitter. And of course, Lou showed them in the video as well. Also, there is an update to the Saturn core. SRG320 posted an update that involves the CD block, which is used for reading CD data, which should improve read compatibility. So it's really one of those things where they're digging in deep to try to make sure the 
you know, the, the core spine of the project is together. Um, I'm probably, I'm probably explaining that wrong, but SRG 320 is really digging in and making sure this is going to come out to be a great core. So much appreciated. Um, Hodego also received a PCB of Splatterhouse. So that could be added to the list of another thing that might be uh, added to core support. And also, Furtech posted high-resolution die images of some decapping chips of the CPS3 hardware. So all of this is amazing. I love seeing Furtech's pictures, and you could support Furtech on Patreon as well. But Furtech takes the time to get the tops off of the chips and then take a microscope to take pictures of them to see how the chips themselves actually work. The pictures are fascinating and you don't need to be a nerd to understand or to appreciate what's there. You just need eyes, basically. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out the post that uh, Furtech put on. And I also love that these came from donor CPS3s that were dead. So you really you're not ruining any of these things you're taking something that was essentially junk and using it to bring life to a whole new platform so everything about that is awesome also lastly dave shadoff is now working on documenting a pc fx ga card which is an isa card that you allowed you to play pc fx game on an ibm compatible dos computer and there's no telling if this is going to turn into a core or just documentation but Even just documentation is always well appreciated because it's very often a bottleneck in some of these projects is just figuring out what some of these things are. So overall, awesome week, lots of cool stuff to talk about. And as always, please check out and subscribe to Lou because there's no way I could keep up with all of this. And I really appreciate having one very easy to listen to video every week where I get all this info right in there. Pixel FX have just announced a new planned roadmap for 2023, and it looks like they're going to be offering three editions of each of their boards, and I absolutely love this. So I'll start with just the facts. There's going to be a light, a pro, and an ultimate version of all of their HDMI kits. So PlayStation 1, N64, and then, of course, uh, and Dreamcast, and then upcoming other consoles as well, which they're still trying to get done for 2023. But the light editions are going to be 100 bucks, and they're essentially just going to have direct original signal output, and then line double to 480p. And at first, you might think, well, that's dumb. Why would you only want 480p? But that accomplishes two really, really awesome things. First and foremost, set it to 480p, and it is compatible with any flat panel TV or VGA CRT monitor with a basic DAC. And you could just start playing your games right now. Also, with a direct mode, you should be able to get component video out and even RGB out via adapters. So if you're already spending the time and money to mod your console, maybe do it that way so you can have support for analog and digital. But most importantly, this is future proof. So even though it only outputs 480p, what happens when the Morph comes out and the RetroTINK 4K, both which have HDMI inputs? Now you set these consoles to direct mode and you let the new fancy scaler do all of the scaling for you. And it's still a true digital to digital signal, but now you're having whatever is the latest scalar technology come out. Uh, So for now, for today, maybe that's not that big of a deal for you, but what's going to happen in 10 years or whatever when an 8K scaler comes out? Or, you know, if we have 16K TVs, you know, going to 1080p might not really cut it, especially if TV manufacturers still don't listen to anybody in the scene's suggestions on how to tweak some of this stuff. So I, I love it. I, I absolutely think that that would be a great solution for anybody who knows they're going to have multiple consoles with HDMI mods and eventually a scaler to use them. However, there are two more tiers. One of them would allow you to go up to 1080p, and then the ultimate tier could go up to 1440p and also have motion adaptive deinterlacing, uh, a free scaler, and all of the crazy um, scan lines and CRT filterings that, uh, that you've seen in some of the other Pixel FX products. So I like those too, but those I think are going to be the best choice for people who say, hey, look, I have a Dreamcast and an N64 and every other console that I want to use is already an HDMI out console. So I don't really need a scaler. I just want to use these consoles and enjoy them on my TV. Well, great, just buy those two kits and it's probably going to be cheaper than buying a scaler and two of the light kits. Or maybe you are just crazy like me and you want the best that you can get right now but those also offer direct modes. So even if you have a 4K TV, going to 1080p or 1440 might be more than enough, 
But eventually, someday, when you get an 8K TV and an 8K scaler comes out, same thing. Set those Ultimate Editions to Direct Mode. And yeah, you know, you lose some of that functionality, but now you can go through whatever crazy scaler is coming out 10 years from now or something. So I just think it's a really smart move. I think offering cheaper tiers are probably going to open up a, a lot more people to, to think about this. And I, I don't know, I just, I think it's a good move. Maybe I'm wrong, but my gut's telling me this was a very smart thing to do. And I hope that they consider doing this for other consoles as well, even if they just start with the light editions, because I think it's going to be a really good complement to their Morph and to Mike's RetroTink 4K, both with HDMI inputs. So if you want more info, check out their website and follow them on social media. More info will be available next month. There's nothing available to pre-order now, but I wanted to give everybody a heads up, just so when these things do come up for sale, yeah, when I post on it about social media and you scramble to get one, you know what it is that you're buying and uh, you're not surprised when it shows up. Modern Vintage Gamer just posted a basic overview of what to expect from the new Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance emulation that's now included in the Nintendo Switch Online. So there's a couple of basic things to go over. First of all, some games are available with just the basic Switch Online service. Others, you need the expansion pack, and I have links to codes for all of that if you're interested in it. It seems like a pretty good deal if you want to play those games, and more games are going to be added in the near future, but maybe you want to check the game list to see if you care at all. But that was a pretty big announcement last week that they're adding these platforms to the Switch Online service. But as always, whenever a new software emulation-based thing is out, especially ones that are paid services on new consoles, I'm always very careful uh, to get my excitement up because we've had some pretty terribly emulated solutions in the past but mvg says that overall he thinks they're pretty good and don't forget mvg is somebody who not only is a developer who's posted some really great videos on how these consoles or handhelds work but he also recently ported a game from the game boy color to the switch via emulation so he's got a lot of insight as to what to expect and I really, I would take his word very seriously because he understands all of the different sides of this. And he seems to think that it's good, that it's pretty impressive. So I think his video is a great primer for anybody that wants just a quick overview. But I do really hope somebody else nerds out with this. I want to see somebody go in and do a lag test comparison, of course. But I also want to see things like performance and frame rate and, you know, the, how the screen looks. And while MVG absolutely glossed over all of that and gives more than enough info for your average person, I want the super nerd version of this. I want like a, a deep dive John Linneman DF retro hour long video digging in. But uh, who knows, maybe DF's already working on something like that. But more importantly, I think start right now with MVG's video and I think you should have a pretty good idea of what to expect and hopefully someday soon we'll get a real deep dive to see because there's so many good games on those platforms and i hate to sound whiny and repetitive but it's not about nostalgia it's about good games and i think if you like a game it really doesn't matter when it was released or what platform it was released on as long as the way that you have to play it is a solid reliable way to enjoy the game who cares when it was made so it's kind of why i get a little bit um preachy about emulation because as long as you um, as long as you're able to make the experience as good or sometimes better than the original it's a really great way to share older games with people that have not seen them yet and on the flip side bad emulation or worse those junky laggy hdmi cables that would do the opposite you have people that have heard how good these games are play it in the wrong method and just think oh those games are crap and now they never get to really experience them. So it's good to see that the Nintendo Switch Online emulation is a better start than their N64 version of it. But definitely check out MVG's video. Well, that's it for this week. As always, thanks to everybody who watches, listens, plays nicely in the comments, and especially thank you to anybody who supports in any way, because it is you who is keeping all of this stuff going. The Mostly behind the scenes research, which you don't see is what I do with most of my time, but you're also keeping the website, the podcast, and all of the products that I'm involved in in some way going as well. So thank you all so much. Links on where to support are just right on the website. And I will see you all next week.